Okay. Months and months and months and months and months ago, <laughs> I promised Tony Muse that we would tackle a topic that he had interest in, and I've always had interest in, and I hope you'll have interest in, and that topic is the hardening of the heart. What does that look like? Um, and I have to tell you that it's a, uh, it's a, it's a weighty topic. It's, uh, it's not for the uh, faint of heart. It's uh, because it, it has tentacles that move into other areas. We're going to explore that. So today, in my opinion, we're scraping the Milky Way. And um, I'm hoping that it uh, will interest you as much as it does me. So let's begin with Joshua chapter 11. Joshua chapter 11. I'm going to try to set the table, so uh, hang with me, okay? Joshua chapter 11, verse 16. Now read through verse 20. I'll let you get there. Joshua chapter 11, verse 16. This was the conquest of the land. This is, that's what's happening here. Joshua has taken over from Moses, and they are entering the promised land, and um, God said, kill them all. So <laughs> that's the big idea. Here's what's happening. Verse 16, thus Joshua took all this land, the mountain country, all the south, all the land of Goshen, the lowland, the Jordan plain, the mountains of Israel and its lowlands, from Mount Halak to the ascent of Seir, even as far as uh, Baal Gad in the Lebanon or the Valley of Lebanon below Mount Hermon, he captured all their kings, struck them down and killed them. Joshua made made war a long time with all those kings. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel except the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon. All the others they took in battle, for it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might utterly destroy them, and they might receive no mercy, but that he might destroy them as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now my question is, do you struggle with that? I think so, because we all think that God's merciful and loving and that this seemed unfair in some sense. That, you know, that these are like innocent people that didn't know anything about him, and they were just unapologetic, doing their own thing, minding their own business, trying to be good. And that is that is the exact opposite of who every one of these people was. So that is well framed, and that is what the average person is going to come away with when they read this. I've had a lot of people respond. Look at the Old Testament. Just merciless. Yeah. How can you make a book like that? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we should expect this, and it's important then that we are able to defend um, the position I, I'm going to take here in a little bit. So, having said that, and that was well said. Uh, Wes, turn, uh, keep, uh, we don't have to keep your place there, but turn over to Psalm 14. Psalm 14 is important to help frame the discussion this morning. 14 or 1 through 3? 14. 14, 1 through 3. These words will sound familiar to you. One fourteen, one through three. The fool has said in his heart, "There is no God." They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Where does that passage sound familiar to you? 
Romans 3. Yes, Romans 3. All quotes. Psalm 14. To <laughs> help us to recognize that in and of ourselves, this is who we are. So, now my question back to Joshua is, does, does it help understand what happened in Joshua? Understanding how God sees our human condition. Will you admit that you, you've got to see all of what we're talking about through the lens of God's glasses? Because what Wes said is absolutely true. The normal average human being is going to go, that's not what fair. fair. It's not fair. Until you have a bigger perspective and you see how God views us and it helps frame it. Say it again? I heard something. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I say. I'll point here that not all fields are right for harvest. Some fields can be cut down. Yeah. Which it is sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, that's well said. I look at it too that uh, it helps me try to understand this better. But, you know, of course, God knows the future. God knows what happens if this, you know, He knows that future. We don't know that. My mm -hmm. brother died when he was 24 years of age. And so, you know, sometimes you struggle with those things, but you recognize God saved him from something. I don't know what, but certainly uh, it is better that he died than whatever he would have lived. Now, it gets harder when you're talking about small children trying to understand that. But the truth mm -hmm. is, God knows the future, and God knows what would have happened. Those people who have not been in school, and it would affect salvation to some degree, possibly. So I think that he's certainly looking at the better overall good. Uh, and he also knows how those folks would have responded. So, you know, it's, if you start getting into those discussions, it, 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 hopefully that helps us understand. Yes. And it takes a mature mind that has an understanding of who God is in order to say what you just said. Because Bad things happen to good people. good people all the time. And so we have to have a bigger picture. And that's what I'm, we want to try to paint this morning. So turn back over to Exodus chapter 3. Is that great? Exodus chapter 3. We'll be in Exodus for a bit. Exodus chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. Okay, to set the table, God is telling Moses, I want you to bring Israel out of Egypt. And I'm telling you, it's not going to be simple. It's, it's going to be difficult. So put your big boy pants on because, um, but I'm, the good news is I'm going to help you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go before you, and a lot's going to happen. So here's what he says in chapter 3 and verse 18 and 19. Then they will heed your voice, and you shall come, you and all the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt. And you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us. And now, please, let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And then God says, But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not even by a mighty hand. I think that's interesting, isn't it? That God would say to Moses, I'm sure that you're not going to be met with, um, yeah, yeah, this is a great idea. Yeah, let me just let these people go on out there and I'll, I'll lose my entire workforce and the pyramids won't get built. <laughs> and all the things that I'm requiring them to do, yeah, no worries. God said, that's not happening. Do you think Moses might have been um, facing a trial? We were, we've been talking about that just these past couple of weeks. 
man, this is a trial to end all trials. I can't wait to have a discussion with Moses when I have lunch with him one day. <laughs> Just tell me about this. Of course, it's going to be easier for Moses to tell you about it since because of the success. You know, the hard part is not knowing the future, having gone through it. I'm sure he'll be very happy to tell you that. As, as a younger man, it would have been probably more difficult. Yeah. yeah. He argued with God several times. Oh, yeah, he had, yeah. You know, and what God wants you to do, he, he argued about it several times. He wasn't, he didn't say he was, had the, uh, education was not good, but he was, educated, he was an educated man. Yeah. So, and he understood the Egyptian way. So. Yeah. Can you just imagine him saying, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute, God. Relax. Just take a breath. Because are you hearing you asking me what, I, or telling me what you want me to do? I just can't take in the conversation. We have what the Bible says, but I, you know, you'd love to have the, the uh, in-between things. Turn to uh, chapter 4. Just the next chapter over, verse 21. It's an interesting passage. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Now, hold on to that. And that's a really important thing. God said, I will harden his heart. Now turn over to chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. What are you sensing from Pharaoh? He's at Psalm 14. <clears throat> yeah, he's definitely um, demonstrating Psalm one or Psalm 14. Absolutely, the hardness of heart. You see the rebellion. Is this an uncommon thing that we see in people? No. No. Do you see it in your um, two-year-old child? Yeah. No hardness of heart in that child, is there? No. He's precious in every way. That is interesting. I will uh, kid young or young parents and say that. You see that little sin that you cover? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we're painting a picture here. Uh, so uh, turn over to chapter 7, verse 14. So the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. Now, these next passages that we're going to look at encompass the first five plagues. The first five plagues that, that God brings on Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. So let's, let's, let's explore those first five. Chapter 7, verse 13. And Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, as the Lord had said. Enter the very first plague. This is what happens next. But what important word do you see there that we ought to keep in mind? Hard, yes. But <clears throat> listen. Grew. Grew. What does that imply? Skip words. Yes. So in, in the normal walk of life, do we see people who are maybe softly pardoned or <clears throat> beginning stages? And then we, do we see it ramp up and sure. I think most people learn of grow to be your heart part and that there's a process. I don't think it's to wake up in your heart's heart. Yes. I think it's something we learn or we allow it happen to us 
ourselves as things in life don't go our way. It's yeah. almost purposeful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in a way, it is because who our who our adversary is, and yeah. he works on our weaknesses. Sure. So, are you saying that this could happen to us? Do you mean? I mean, I'm not asking you to name a name, and I don't want you to. But I'll bet you could probably think of someone who, at one time, may have been white hot for God, but they've since become hardened. That that temperature has raised up, and the and the, the clay is no longer soft. And that's, that's what's happening here. Okay, we looked at 7.13. Look at verse 22. I was amazed at how often I'm seeing this passage. Then the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. Look at um, verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not heed them. This is in the second plague. Now, so far we have seen who hardened a heart. God did. But here we're seeing what? Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Okay, now don't get tripped up by... Um, uh, that's the word I want. One, uh, one going before another, that's a C word. What's the word? A C word there. That it, it's, um, it doesn't have to be in line. In other words. What is it? Calls out. No, that's a good Order. guess, though. Consecutive. Order. Consecutive. Yes, thank you very much. That's what I'm looking for. Don't get tripped up by that, because I think you're going to see something... Um, really emerge in a little bit, but I don't want to tell you yet. All right, let's keep on going. We're in um, 819, 819. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had said. Now look at verse 32. Not one remained, but Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. Now look at 9-7. 9-7. But the heart of Pharaoh became hard, and he did not let the people go. Now, that's the first of the first five plagues. And notice how many times God is telling us about the hardness of heart. Very important. Now watch what happens in the next five plagues. In 9, chapter 9, and verse 12. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of the servant. Chap uh, chapter 10, verse 20. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the children of Israel go. Verse 27. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. And then Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. I don't want to see you anymore, he told him to Moses. Moses said, You wish is my command, you won't see me again. And all of this began with probably, if I don't miss my guess, Pharaoh thinking that he was all that. What did the the pharaohs of Egypt typically believe they were God. They were God. Yeah, they were God. 
Who is the Lord that I should listen to him? Don't you know I'm a God? I am the God? <clears throat> and doesn't it all begin there in the heart of man? Pride. Yeah. I mean, at the very the common denominator, the least thing that we can imagine is pride. And no wonder he said what he said in Psalm 14 and Paul quoted him uh, in Romans chapter 3. So I wanted you to see the, um, the, the scenario. Now look at chapter 9 verse 16 because this is a telling statement. We're beginning to see the whys behind what all's happening here. Verse 16 of chapter 9. But indeed for this purpose I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Now, who is he saying this about? Pharaoh. <clears throat> yes. Hey, Bubba. I, I raised you up. All you're doing is accomplishing my purpose. For this reason, I have raised you up. Now, that's a telling statement. And it holds hands with Exodus 33. And if you know anything about Exodus 33, it is an amazing chapter very tender where Moses says to God, hey, we're buds, right? And they are. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that um, they were friends. Abraham has that nice little tag attached to him as well. What was the last verse you were on? It was 9.16. Exodus 9.16. But turn over to Exodus 33 where... Moses says to God, okay, we're friends. I want to see your face. <laughs> I, I, want, I, want a, I want a meeting with you up close and personal. And God said, of course, that can't happen, man, because it would kill you if you saw me. I'll hide you over here in the cleft of the rock, and I'll let my goodness pass by you and you can see my, me from behind, but it'll kill you, dude, to see me up close. You don't want that. <laughs> but what? Listen to this passage. It's it's really interesting, and it's it's especially framed um, in uh, the Moses God um, relationship. Exodus thirty three and verse nineteen. And Moses said to him, show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. At the end of the day, what do you derive from that? I've always thought that God, you know, God doesn't take a great, loving, kind person and turn them bad. That, that God knows the future and He knows who they are. So, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but that, that, that's what I've always thought. That, in other words, He's not hard to hard to point making a good person bad. He already knows what they are and who they're going to become. And the circumstances that God's going to bring, that's how they're going to respond. And that's yes. how I've always thought of it. Yeah. Truly, you are looking at it from a, uh, from a bigger picture, which is critical to understanding this topic, that we, that we, that we back out and see the, uh, the whole forest. Most people don't see the forest for the trees. And if you just are isolated in your thinking, then this passage you might overlook. In other words, God is saying... I am God, you are not, and I'll darn well do what I please. And there's a word for that, sovereign. sovereign. Yeah, he's sovereign. So 
let's not get up on our high horse here because I think it's important that we remember that we're all clay. And he, he's the potter. He's even said that. If you'll recall, when we did the Roman study, Paul said that. You're just clay. And if he wants to, Allie, he can make you this amazing, amazing vase that houses the most beautiful flowers you can imagine. And it will set you back and stun you with his glory. And Bill, he can make you an ashtray if he wants. I'm going to put my butt out. <coughs> and when we know our place, when we know our place, then it helps us. And I think, Cliff, you understand we got to know our place. We, we see how God sees. And until we do, man, we're going to be in a, a world of trouble. Well, the Pharaoh was a perfect example of that. So God told him, I raised you up for this purpose, mm -hmm. to show my power. And yet, you are taking credit for having that power. Well said. Look what happened to Pharaoh. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. It's not Jesus said the same thing to Pilate. Yes. Uh, um, remind us of that yeah. scenario. Well, you know, Pilate, when Jesus was standing before him, Pilate says, well, you do not realize that I can have you crucified or I can let you go. And Jesus' response to him was, you wouldn't have any authority over me if it wasn't given to you from above. Wow. When, when you are in conversation with people and they're wringing their hands and, oh, I don't know what's going to happen, and this is, this is good stuff. Hey, nothing's happening that God's not aware of and isn't allowing for a bigger purpose. So I want to show that to you in Romans chapter 9. It's really important because this um, Romans chapter 9, verse 14 through 18. Romans chapter 9, verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Paul says, certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Interesting. When you and I see that developed in the, in the scripture, I think it ought to give us an understanding of, hmm, I'm, 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 st I'm starting to see the nature of man and who it is I'm talking with and how difficult this person um, is regarding all things spiritual. And if you have this understanding, I think you have a better chance of reaching him and because you understand how hard the hardness of heart works. And I think we're seeing it unfold right here. So my question is, and I, it's a simple question. It, can this be true of you and I? Can, can believers heart harden? Yes, yes, sir. I want to shut. Go ahead. Did you, were you going to say something? Uh, Solomon was distracted with that also. Well, yeah. Yeah, he was totally distracted. And uh, um, a thousand women in his harem, that would do it. That would, yeah, no kidding. Yeah, turn over to um, Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16.
and look at verse uh, 14. Jesus had already been crucified. He had already um, risen from the dead. Later, verse 14, he appeared to the 11 as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and what? Hardness, Hardness of heart. This is, these, this is the guys who were closest to him. It's interesting how he rebuked their hardness of heart. That's uh, chapter 16 and, and verse 14. Because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Now this wasn't a process. This was an event that hardened their hearts. Yes. And also... That's, that's important to know, Jack. It doesn't necessarily have to be a process. It can be an event. You know, all of us perhaps have been at the place where something, we were in a world of trouble financially, physically, emotionally. It could be when we're going through a tough time of divorce. A child's gone south on us. All these things are events. And many of them are processes. But in the midst of that, we got to be careful because we, who love Jesus, or else you wouldn't be here, can develop a hardness of heart. And Russ is strategic. This is unbelief. Yes. Yeah, that's, that is strategic. That is important. So we have to deal with it. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter uh, 3. Because this is not just an unbeliever. This is you and me. And this is where it gets very personal and applicational. Hebrews chapter 3. And let's take a look at uh, verse 12. 312. Beware what? Who is that? Believing people. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Same thing he saw we saw in the disciples. In departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be what? Hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end while it is said, Today, do not our, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And who, he has in, who does he have in mind there? Yeah, the Exodus, yeah, the Exodus generation. God had to go ten times before he finally said send the spies out and they'll show you what I'm talking about. They'll come back with a report. Did that fare well? Two of them. Two of them came back with a good report. And who entered into this promised land? Joshua and Caleb. Two. Of the entire Exodus generation, he killed the rest in the wilderness. Killed them off. Two. <laughs> Who believed what God said. Isn't that fascinating? Because you mentioned unbelief. We saw it here in this passage. So according to this passage, how do we keep from developing the hardness of heart? Well, even Moses, even Moses didn't enter. Say it again, Cliff. Even Moses didn't enter because of... Uh, yes, his moment of unbelief. Event, but, but That's right, he didn't. It seems so, the key goes back to the first verse you started with, with. He is to keep seeking God. Okay. Stop for a stretch. Yes, well said. Keep seeking God and keeping a tender heart toward what's important to him. 
Draw near and hold fast. <coughs> That's well said. Draw near and hold fast. Yes. Now look in the passage, <coughs> verse 12. What else could help us from developing the hardness of heart? <coughs> Fellowship. Where do you see that? One another day. So if we isolate ourselves, could that lend toward the hardness of the heart? Do we need each other? Yes. 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 We do. And that, and that might take a humbling of ourselves to admit, man, I need you because you could speak something into my life that is going to help me grow and develop this heart that's tender toward God. Who? I don't know. I've had many, many people speak into my life to help me. And maybe you can share a story about how that was true of you when someone maybe called you out on something. What does that look like? Sobering brings me uh, that individual brought me from out of that shady area that I was in mm -hmm. just for a couple of words. So is it possible that a person can say you know what? I'm, I'm nervous about this relationship that you're in. Is that possible? And how how could we receive that? Four. Four. Yeah. Four. That's none of your business. Here's the, here's the one that I, I never liked was when the wife comes to you and says, I don't like your relationship with so and so. I've known them forever. I've known them since I knew you. That's that's not don't like that one. That's real. That is real. <laughs> <laughs> That's real. So, I, let's say I'm in a relationship that's not healthy, and someone says, Russ, that's not a good idea that you're with that person. You're still married to someone else. Hey, God wants me to be happy. What say you? Uh, embellish. I say God wants you. God won't tempt you with false happiness. Isn't it possible when you look at this and you do this kind of stuff? Most times we have to have some kind of working relationship. And so if you do something like that, you have to take the scriptures and look at it and make sure that you're doing it according to the scriptures which is with love and not out of your own self looking at condemning a person. Uh, there's a big difference in you know, putting that back there. That's, that's important. I remember a situation where a guy came to me and he, um, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm moving in this direction. And I said, okay, um, I just want you to uh, hear from God. Is that important to you on this? He said, well, yeah. Okay. So I took him to Romans chapter 1 and in Three different times in Romans chapter 1, it said God gave them over. And this was a, a choice of lifestyles that he th thought he would want to uh, pursue. And I said, and I had him read it to me. And I said, does it sound like God's okay with that? So I, I didn't want to be the heavy. I wanted God to be the heavy. 
And so I just ask the question, does it sound like God's okay with this decision you're making, this choice that you're pursuing? And he hung his head and said, no, it doesn't sound like God's okay with that. And so it was beautiful. God gave me what I, exactly what I needed to help this guy right the ship. So I did have a relationship with him, Ken. That was important. But, um, and that's, that's a bonus. But God can use you and me in the lives of others using that, that technique, just asking questions. And I love the question, do you think God's okay with that? So I just asked the question to a woman who was not in a good relationship, chopped up, and it went south. And I said, you guys um, intimate? Yeah. Was, you think God's okay with that? <laughs> I didn't have to say one more thing. She recognized that no, and she said that. No, God's not okay with that. examples like the GDS and Grace Alliance where they differ on some very important issues mm -hmm. and it's caused some some problems. Yes. I yes. still have not been totally reconciled. Mm -hmm. so, yes, yeah, so there's one more thing in this passage we dare not overlook. You you recognize one of them, fellowship. Exhort one another daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. What, what other thing must we recognize in that passage? Sin. sin. It's always there. And what specifically about sin? The deception that it brings to us. I always say, hey, everything is cool. We're supposed to go with God and the world. Yeah. The deceitfulness of sin. Do you think we need each other to remind each other that, remember when we talked about Cain and Abel and, and God said, sin is crouching at the door and it what? It desires to have you. Oh my. So we need to be honest with each other regarding the deceitfulness of sin because we can become deluded. God wants me to be happy, and I am happy, way more happy with this person than I am my wife. It, those are hard things to say, aren't they? But I think God can use us in the life of another if we're sensitive to that passage. <laughs> I told you this was hard, but it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful card. You remember in the movie, A League of the Room, when Dottie was leaving right before the World Series, and the coach, who was Tom Hanks, was hacked off about it. And he walked up to her and he said, this is not who you are. And she said, I don't need this. I've got Tom. We're going to go have babies. And I don't need this. And he said, you're going to regret this for the rest of your life. And so he stormed off. And he came back to her and he said, I wouldn't, I've lost five years of my career to drinking. There's not one thing I would do not get it back. And she said, it just got too hard. And he said, it's supposed to be hard. If it weren't hard, everyone would do it. 
the heart is what makes it great. That's pretty good counsel. This is hard. This is hard. But it's what makes it great. When you see the bigger picture of God at work. It's pretty awesome. Appreciate you guys. Let's pray.